the deer hunting season is upon us, so I'm, I'm fine-tuning my, my, my musket here. I'm going to go out and sight it in today, make sure we can harvest our, our winter's meat. Um, and I thought it was a good opportunity to tell a wee bit of history, or history by the hearth, if you would, while I'm waiting for coffee to brew. So on a cool, misty morning in 1808, they're laying a very controversial uh, frontiersman uh, to rest. And y you know that if, if we can remember the, what the weather conditions were like 250 plus years ago, that he, he would be a person of note. And the person I'm talking about is Lewis Wetzel, commonly known as, as Lou. Uh, and he's on his deathbed, and, and a quote he makes, which will give you a glimpse into the personality of the man, is he says, I might as well die, there's no more Indians to hunt. And he made hunting Indians uh, a lifetime passion, if you would, and I'm going I'm to get into that. But he's, he's all of 44 years old, and he also makes a comment that I, I'm too old to go into the mountains. So we have Lewis. Now, it's a shame that, that Lewis Wetzel didn't learn to read or, or write anything more than his name, because he would have filled in a whole lot of blanks on, on what we called the borderland or the Ohio border at the time period. So I'm going to pour myself a cup of coffee and I'm going to get in depth into, uh, well, maybe not in depth, but I'm going to get a wee bit in depth, uh, if you would, into the life and times of Lewis Wetzel. So Mr. Wetzel, he, he's born he's born in 1774 in um, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and he's one of seven children. And the father moves the family, the entire family, west of the Appalachians into what the the king had dictated was Indian territory. See, the king, after the French and Indian Wars was over, he said the Appalachian Mountains is the line. West of the Appalachians is native country, and east of the Appalachians would be the colonies. And they're still American colonies, because the American Revolution is still 20, 25 years away. Uh, although, arguably, you could say the French and Indian Wars were the start of it. But the settlers weren't going to have any part of that. They thought they were fighting for land, so they flood into Indian territory. There's a lot of uh, animosity by the natives. They're hunting their animals. They're destroying their lands, they're cutting forests down for fields, and they're not happy about it. And we enter into what is, without question, the most turbulent time in North American history. And the atrocities done by natives and whites alike uh, are recorded, and, and they're quite disturbing to read if one researches that, that time period. So Wetzel's father realizes they're, they're in a very dangerous part of the world, so he, he makes a great efforts to, to introduce frontier skills, if you would, or woodsman's skills to both his sons and his daughters. So sh shooting, uh, handiwork with knife and tomahawk, and endurance, agility, tracking. But of all of the seven children, Wetzel takes to this very well. He becomes very, very proficient at it. And he's about to start a campaign where he's simply going to hunt down natives for, for, a, for a hobby, if you would. Like, it's going to become his lifelong passion to hunt and kill Indians. Now, to the frontiersmen at the time who wanted retaliation or revenge, he's viewed as a hero. Others simply looked at him as a, a sociopathic uh, killer, um, amounting to nothing short of murder. So to understand the man, we have to look at his personality. He was first and foremost an eccentric, and he was also a complete loner. It's said that he was uh, quite often friendly with dogs and children, but more often than not very aloof with adults. From a physical appearance, um, he's said to stand approximately six feet tall. Raw bone is a description I, I've heard. He had jet black eyes. His skin was badly pockmarked from a near-fatal um, case of smallpox as an infant. Uh, but one of the most distinctive appear, um, features, if you would, of his appearance was his raven hair that he never cut. And it's said that if combed out, it would reach almost to his ankles. So, yeah, he's, he's a fellow that, uh, that stood out, and he, and he had these frontier skills that, that people admired and his abilities. 
But what triggers the man into his hatred of Indians takes place in 1778, when a then 13-year-old Lewis and his 11-year-old brother are captured by the Wyandotte natives. So they're taking them back to their camp, whether they're going to adopt them, torture them, make them run the gauntlet, we don't know. So on the third night out, the Wyandotte, they kind of let their guard down, because these are just young, young kids, first and foremost. They, they don't know what they're de dealing with, with this Lewis fellow. But they're camped on their third night. Now, they've made quite a great distance. They made the boys walk barefoot. They took their moccasins away from them. So they let the guard down, and in the night, uh, they, the two of them escape. And as they're going, now they have to keep off the trails, and, and Wetzel realizes they're not going to be able to go through this rough terrain without, without footwear. So he tells his 11-year-old brother Jacob to lay low. He sneaks back into the camp. Natives are all sound asleep. He takes a couple of pair of moccasins that were drying by the fire, heads back to his brother. Then he gets there and he thinks, darn all that, they've got my dad's rifle, his, his dad's favorite musket, which he was carrying at the time they were captured. So if he doesn't sneak back into the camp, like the audacity of this 13-year-old kid just fascinates me. He, he retrieves his dad's musket, a powder horn, some, some, some lead balls, and he goes back to his brother. Now off they go, and the natives are in hot pursuit at this point. They, they, they elude a capture three times, and they make the, their way to the Ohio River. They fashion a raft out of logs, tie it together with bark. They're able to get over to an island where there's some kids uh, on a fishing trip are, are on, on this island, and they help them get back to Fort Henry. And the story just gets better from there on in. I should, I should point out that when, when Lewis and his brother Jacob are captured by the Wyandotte, Lewis takes a grazing shot across his chest. It actually takes a chunk of bone out of his sternum, very painful wound, reportedly. He's able to stop the bleeding, and now he's back at Fort Henry and he's recovering from his wounds. And he makes a vow. He says, I'll kill every Indian that crosses my path as long as God lets me live. Now, this is a vow made by a very young man, a child almost. I mean, he's barely 13 years old. However, it's a vow that this, this, this young fellow never gave up on, and, and it was a passion that he carried through till his death at age 44. Now, the Indians of the time period were very slow or reluctant, if you would, to respect um, white people of any kind. But if they had skills, skills that were as good or better than their own as woodsmen, so people like Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton, Simon Gurdy, these were men that they, they, they natives respected, and they gave them names. And they actually gave Lewis Wetzel a name that stuck with him until his death, and that was called Deathwind. They called him Deathwind. And one of the reasons he was so good at what he did was that as a very young age, his father taught him to shoot and load a flintlock musket on the run. Now, even if you're standing upright and you're not being pursued by somebody who wants to take your scalp, it's a slow, tedious thing to load. So the first thing you do is put a measured powder charge down the barrel, pull out your ramrod, you place a patched ball on the muzzle, you ram that down onto the powder charge, you open your frizzen, you put a little powder in the, in the flash pan, you put your gun at full cock, close the frizzen, aim and fire. But Lewis Wetzel learned to do this on, on, on a dead run. Now, I, I've practiced this a lot. And uh, at my age, I don't run so fast anymore. But I can still do it at a slow trot, if you would. But not really efficient. But Lewis Wetzel was like a machine. And he carried in his satchel, he'd carry round balls that were slightly smaller than the caliber uh, of the barrel that he wouldn't patch. And he literally spit them down. So I'm thinking, and he carried mouthfuls of these lead balls if he was being pursued. And the idea was in that time period, once you'd emptied your musket, you'd fired it off. Well, the, your pursuer could chase you down and use something like well, a tomahawk, uh, a war club, and, uh, and they'd dispatch you. But Lewis, he was so good at it, he, he'd spit a ball down. He'd, he'd just charge it from his powder measure while running, spit a ball down the barrel, bang it really hard to get enough powder to come out the frizzing hole, and he'd fire off and turn around and fire a native at close range. So he was, he was very good at that. But what cemented, really cemented, Lewis Wetzel's hatred 
of NATO's was in June of 1778, so four years after he's captured. So he's a 17-year-old man now. There are four Wetzel men are out on a hunting party, and they're returning to Baker Station. Now, they're overtaken by Indians, and uh, three, three of them, his father, George, and, and uh, Martin, are wounded. Uh, Lewis is able to get in a canoe, apparently, and he paddles out of range of their musket balls. Now, he does retrieve his, his, his two siblings and his father, and they're making their way back to Baker Station. And Wetzel's father, John, and his brother, George, succumb to their wounds. Martin does end up surviving them. But this really cements um, Lewis Wetzel's hatred of, of the natives. There, there's absolutely no question that uh, Lewis Wetzel's skills are right up there with the famous frontiersmen, as I mentioned, Daniel Boone, Kenton, and Gertie, and the likes. The difference is there's a, there was a time when, um, and it's a good example, where Simon Kenton uh, overpowers a, a lone Shawnee warrior, and he tomahawks him to death. And, and he, later in life, he, he expresses remorse over doing that. And, and he says, and I quote, uh, he was in my power and I need not have done it. So we see the difference between frontiersmen, famous frontiersmen that, that respected the majority of natives for their skills and abilities versus um, Louis Wetzel, who had an absolute hatred for them. So there's a classic example where public favor, because Lewis still at this time is seen as a, as a public hero. So I'm going to take you to a time, an incident that, that sort of turns uh, public favor against Wetzel. So there's a, a Seneca chief named uh, Tagunta, and, and he's a, a peaceful one. And actually, he's going to bring allies to, to the Americans, and he's, he's en route to Fort Hamer when Lewis Wetzel shoots him and scalps him. Now, now Tukunthe, he, he lives long enough to identify his killer. So, so because he was such a respected man and they needed the allies, uh, the Indians as allies, um, they, they, capture, they capture Wetzel. Now Wetzel goes to jail, he escapes. Uh, he's caught a second time. He's in jail and he, waiting trial and he, he overcomes his jailer by beating him apparently with his chains. He escapes a second time. He's finally captured in um, Kentucky and uh, he's taken to Fort Washington to stand trial. Now at this point the locals intervene because like I say, is he, is he villain or is he, is he a hero? So Simon Kenton shows up with a mob of 200 men at the courthouse threatening peace. And so Wetzel's let go. But at this point, Wetzel needs, he, he's got to get himself a pretty bad reputation. So he leaves the border country and he makes his way to Louisiana. Now, now he gets involved in some kind of a counterfeit scheme. He's captured, he goes to trial, he goes to jail for a few years. And that sort of brings us to, to the end of Wetzel's story. By the time, by this time, he's near, near his death. And just to show his personality, when he's dying, he could have received some medical treatment, but he refuses it. And back to that quote about, I'm too old to go in the mountains, and there aren't any Indians left to hunt. So I guess to sum up, um, a boy learns to hate when society encourages him. And when your friends and family encourage you to act upon that hatred, um, it, in my mind, that's what created Lewis Wetzel. So I, I'm going to leave you with a song. I'm, I'm actually going to get out a guitar, which uh, uh, certainly wasn't an instrument of the 1700s, but it's, it's my instrument. And I'm going to leave you with a song that was written by Peter Kowski. And uh, for those that love history, um, you should check him out. If you like early American history, his, 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 he's a, a phenomenal musician, and his songs... Uh, literally tell the story, much better than I can, of uh, the Americas during the frontier period. Long grow the locks hung below the shoulder of a warrior and a rogue. Silent as a fox, though hot much colder, Hunter always hunts alone 
Many were the scalps taken in war, the grim trophies of his life. He feels the power and only lusts for more, vengeance for others, scalping knives, and Wetzel's mind is fever. Killing is all he knows, no God does he believe in, save the death wind when it blows, save the death wind when it blows. Swift as a deer, gun always loaded, bitter shadow on their land. A demon spell he is under, always watching from the hills. He feels no cold, he knows no hunger. Is and breathes only to kill. Wetzel's mind is fevered. Black, the color of his soul. No God does he believe in. Say the death wind when it blows. Say the death wind when it blows. Swift through the glade, deep forest shadows, his heart beats to the devil's drum. High rocky caves, his retreat for battle, dark as the many deeds he's done. Hateful and haunting, child of the border, Raised in the violence of his times Constantly stalking He gives no quarter When his prey is in his sight And wets his mind is fevered Killing is all he knows No God does he believe in Say the death wind when it blows Say the death wind when it blows